Living things grow. How would one know if they were alive in Christ? Let me say it again. Living things grow. People who are alive in Christ grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to head off any questions that might be asked. I don't want anyone approaching me and saying, well, pastor, do you still run three miles a day? I've come to the place in life where I don't believe in running unless something awful is chasing me. <laughs> but I try to replace that with other activities that are beneficial. But I want to show you a passage in Timothy that will be the overarching theme for this series of messages, the disciplines of discipleship. And while you're finding 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8, which will be the overarching verses that we'll look at every week and remind ourselves of every week in this month of January, let me say to you that some people, Baptist people in particular, are so aware of grace that when you start talking about discipline, some of us think you're being heretical. But if you think about it, the word disciple, which we are ought all to be very comfortable with because of those disciples who followed Jesus that He chose, and because of the term disciple applied to those who have trusted in Jesus, that word itself implies discipline. It's the same concept. A disciple and a disciplined individual are exactly the same concept. And so let me show you what God moved the Apostle Paul to write to Timothy in verses 7 and 8 of chapter 4 of 1 Timothy. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value. Those of you that are just going to wear yourselves out on treadmills and all of that kind of thing, please note, some value. Man, if, if, when I think about the miles that I've walked and ran and the weights that I've lifted and the games that I've played, played full court basketball until I was 43 years of age and had to quit because of ankles and knees. When I think about all of that, I, I, and, and then I read this word, is of some value. Some value. But godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Please don't miss that. The present life. Training yourself to be godly will benefit you in this present life in unimaginable ways, in immeasurable ways. But it also certainly, more than we could possibly appreciate, has benefits for the life to come. Do you know the Bible teaches about rewards? Did you know that? Did you know that everyone's experience in heaven will apparently not be exactly the same? Did you know that? I often try to explain that to people by talking about the reality of capacity. Now let's just take computer technology. I don't have the capacity to appreciate computer technology as much as someone who works in the field. I keep running into terms I don't understand, concepts with which I'm unfamiliar. There will be people in heaven, I'm afraid, who will have not prepared themselves for the glories that await them. Now, they'll be there, and they'll be safe and saved and all of that, but they will not have the experience that one who had developed a capacity 
and thereby receive the rewards of that capacity might have. You say, well, pastor, that's work salvation. We're not talking about salvation. That's not what we're talking about. We are talking about the same thing Paul was talking about when he said that training yourself to godliness has benefits for the life to come. He didn't say that carelessly. He said that intentionally. And it has meaning. Now the other text, the text for today, is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. And you have that noted in your bulletin if you found it. And we'll pick up at verse 13 there. Matthew 16, verse 13, a very familiar passage to most of us, a passage situated at Caesarea Philippi, a place that was a veritable garden of gods. There were all kinds of religions practiced there. This area was known for its temples to various deities. It was a place that teemed with the religious attitudes of the first century world. And it was in that setting that this happened. (coughs) When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, He asked, Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Oh, how we puzzle over that ending. But I present it to you to show you that this was dangerous information that Peter had just relayed. And the cross might have happened the next day had the word gotten out too quickly. For he was indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God, but he was not the Christ that the religious authorities wanted or expected. And so the information that Peter shares here is dangerous. By the way, it is still a threat to the world and to the world systems, as I hope to make clear uh, as we share this time together today. There's something about a new year that causes us to resolve to change certain things about our lives. I've always said that the largest room in anyone's house is the room for improvement. Allow me to challenge you to redouble your practice of following Jesus. Nothing you could resolve to do this year would yield greater rewards. In fact, countless others would be benefited greatly by the effects of making this choice. It'll benefit you. It'll benefit everyone you know and everyone you love. If you resolve to redouble your efforts at following Jesus. You know, I was thinking about attitudes people have about God. And I remembered a man that I was pastor to some years ago who had a real drinking problem. Now, he'd been quite active in a Baptist church most of his life, but he had a drinking problem. And we became good friends. He knew me quite well. And so he decided to tell me about it and trust me with that information. And uh, this is what he said. It's unforgettable to me. He said, I've been praying to God about it. He said, I've been telling God, God, I don't want to drink anymore. I pray, God, that you'll just take away from me the desire to drink. But he doesn't take it away. So I keep drinking. So he was mad at God because God wouldn't take away his desire to drink. That's how weird we get. We have this idea that somehow God is supposed to zap us. And without any response on our part, without any discipline on our part, to change things about our lives that need to change. Where is that in the Bible? That is a false gospel. It is true that only God can forgive us of sin 
And only God can make us into a child of God. That is true. But it is not true that you do not have to do a thing to experience change. I'm sorry if no Baptist preacher ever told you that before. I am telling you that today. That is a false gospel. And there is plenty of Scripture to support what I've just said. So what's first? That's always a question that ought to be asked. What is first? And I propose today that you be sure that you're following the real Jesus. Do you realize that it's possible for us to create our own God? Some professors at Baylor University did some research, and they went nationwide interviewing all kinds of professing believers all over this nation, even that crazy bunch up north you know, that goes to funerals and makes such a fool of themselves, they went there and spent a week with those people. And what they discovered in all of that research was that there are basically four gods in America. In other words, people have psychological constructs of who God is. They create a God. Now, God created us, but there are people who create God. And then they begin to order their lives around the God they've created. Now, As I say that, you say, well, wait a minute, isn't there a real God? Yes. But the fact is that there's a tendency, a temptation that people have to create a God. And guess what? They create a God who's just like them. A God who hates the people they hate and loves the people they love. Well, that's not God. And you know they do the same thing to Jesus. People begin to construct a Jesus... That's the kind of Jesus they want to follow. A Jesus who would never make anybody uncomfortable. Good luck on finding that Jesus in the Scripture. A Jesus who is so gracious and so kind that He would never hold anyone accountable. He would never challenge anybody's behavior. He's just nice. Well, that's not the real Jesus. And so if you're going to follow Jesus, and if you're going to practice the disciplines of discipleship, you better be sure that you're going to follow the real Jesus on His terms as He is presented in the living Word of God. Why do we need to be certain about this? Because casual Christianity is killing us in this country. It is killing us. It is killing our families. It is killing our nation. It is killing our culture. Casual Christianity is the problem. When people say, what's gone wrong in America? Why is America in such a mess? I don't blame the people out there. They're just doing what lost people do. I blame the church. And I blame this tendency to just sort of be a a, a lazy, casual Christian. No discipline, no effort, just sort of drift with the time. Sort of adapt what we believe to what might be popular and acceptable in a given time. Casual Christianity is killing us. And it is killing our nation. I think we need to be certain we're following the real Jesus also because many people call this the information age. Now listen to this. Listen carefully. It is also the misinformation age. Never has it been easier to lie and get away with it. Some of you probably go to Wikipedia, for instance, and Wikipedia has some really good information. It really does. But do you realize that people can correct information on Wikipedia who have no idea what they're talking about? They allow people just to get in there and just kind of put in their facts that they think belong with a given story. And so people go to Wikipedia thinking, oh, good, an online encyclopedia, and I've got the facts here. Well, you better check your facts. This is the misinformation age, as well as the information age. And in this misinformation age where lying has become so easy, and and you can destroy somebody's reputation in one day if you choose to do so by just flooding the media with lies. It is important for us to be able to tell the truth from error. And to know the real Jesus and follow the real Jesus. Because there is, whether you know it or not, whether you 
realize it or not, there is a campaign out there to reinvent Jesus. In fact, there's a book by that title written by several authors, Reinventing Jesus, which catalogs that reality in our day. Never have I seen anything like it. In all my years as a pastor, I have never seen the efforts being expended and the reams of print being produced to create a false Christ, to reinvent Jesus. But it also is important that we follow the real Jesus and be certain about the identity of Jesus because of what Jesus said to us, the things He said to us that are recorded in the Word. I shared one last week when Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest under your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, some people hear that and they say, Well, I don't see anything easy about it. Well, let me tell you, the only thing that's not easy about following Jesus, and you need to hear me very carefully. The only thing that is not easy about following Jesus is wading through all of the garbage that people have said that is not true about Him. But when you connect with the real Christ, you'll find out what He meant when He said, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. It will be a delightful experience, an exhilarating experience, and an inspirational experience to follow the real Jesus. And you'll discover by experience why Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Life to the full, life to the max. He wasn't talking about eternity when he said that. He was talking about right now. An abundant life, a full and meaningful life right now and for all of eternity, both. So what about these modern myths about Jesus? Well, I I thought I would bring something. I I keep in a file in my office a series of magazine articles that have a picture of Jesus on the cover uh, that have been written over recent years, relatively recent years. And i got to tell you, I have probably looked at every one of them, whether it be U.S. News and World's Report or Time Magazine or, uh, or any of the other publications that have written about Jesus, Newsweek. And I've got to tell you, I have yet to read one that was true to the real Jesus. Not even one! Now, let me ask you a question. Does the average citizen, are they more likely to carefully read the Gospels or Time Magazine? Yeah, you know that, don't you? The average citizen. So the average citizen is getting a false picture of Jesus from trusted publications. By the way, if you're trusting these publications, you're in real trouble. I hate to say that, but that's just where we are. That's just the time that we're living in. Can I give you some of the myths that are out there about Jesus? Some of them are saying scholars uh, are discovering, Bible scholars they say, a radically different Jesus from the ones that Christians have traditionally believed in. And the way they've discovered that is they have found these manuscripts or began to study these manuscripts that present different Christianities. Now that's, that's one of the myths that's out there. Well, guess what? We knew about those manuscripts that they're talking about my entire life. My goodness, I studied about those manuscripts in college as well as in seminary training. Those manuscripts came along later by enemies of Christianity, by people who were trying to to muddy the water and, and make money. Have you seen anybody doing that lately, trying to make money in the name of religion? They were never in any way comparable to the text of Scripture that you hold in your hand when you hold the Bible. But there are people out there who know better, who are intentionally trying to put some of those writings, heretical writings, on equal footing with Scripture. And it is tragic, and yet it's there. And don't you think our young people don't know it? I've counseled with young people who grew up right here in Georgetown, in our churches, who have bought into the nonsense that they're taught in religion classes 
in universities right here in the state of Texas and some of them right here in our own city. That kind of narrows it down a little, doesn't it? Yeah. Second, second. The church tampered with the text of Scripture so you can't trust it. Well, that's utter nonsense. The earliest manuscripts that we have, uh, there wasn't time for them to figure out what they wanted to do to change the text. And we have quotes that are almost contemporaneous with the time of Jesus. Direct quotes. We could reconstruct the New Testament. We could reconstruct the New Testament with quotes from some of those first followers of Jesus in the very beginning of Christianity. Even if we didn't have a manuscript of the New Testament, we could rebuild it just from surviving quotes. So the idea that the church just sort of twisted the text to fit what they wanted to say is it's ludicrous. One of the greatest scholars of New Testament studies that's come along in modern times was Bruce Metzger. I actually met Bruce Metzger. He passed away last year. And I have listened to Bruce Metzger as he talked about the reliability and the authority and the authenticity of Scripture. And yet these characters who really aren't even textual critics, who don't really even know how to study manuscripts, who come at this with a bias, a liberal bias, trying to construct a Jesus they're more comfortable with, that's who the world is listening to. But don't you be fool enough to listen. You be sure that you're following the real Jesus. New discoveries have helped us realize, some say, that the resurrection did not happen. Oh, really? I'm not aware of any new discoveries that would even begin to explain the transformation of the disciples and, for that matter, the transformation of the world based on the life of Jesus, other than that they believed passionately and were willing to die for the truth that Jesus not only was the Son of God, as Peter said in our text, but that he triumphed over death. Some would say that uh, Jesus was some kind of a political imposter who thought he could bring in a messianic age, but he failed. Have you looked around the world lately? Does it look to you like Christianity failed? Do you understand that we're probably just about the only populous nation on earth that's not experiencing a revival? Do you understand that Africa is so rapidly being Christianized that they have baptismal services where over a thousand people are baptized in rivers in one experience of baptism, in one place of baptism? That doesn't sound like failure to me. The failure belongs to those who are foolish enough not to live and follow Jesus. And then finally, if you were to group these, this is the interesting one for me. People should be free to pick and choose what to believe about Jesus. <sighs> if I hear that one more time, I'm liable to punch somebody out in Christian love. Where on earth did we get to the place where we see democracy as applying to what we believe about anything? If I want 2 plus 2 to be 5, I ought to be free to, well, good night. Go ahead. Fall off, you know, fall off. The, by the way, I got in a taxi in Washington, D.C. last week, and I asked them, would you take me to the fiscal cliff? I've been hearing a lot about it, and I, I'd like to go see it. He looked at me rather strange. But go ahead and fall off that spiritual cliff. If, if, you just can't, if you just can't accept that some things are just true and, and just get over your reluctance to accept them and have to just construct everything to suit yourself, you're already gone. You're ruined before you start, and everything in life is going to beat you to a pulp because, like it was said in the movies, you can't handle the truth. You need to be able to handle the truth. So there are certainly a lot of myths about Jesus. Ah, but there is power. There is power in partnering with the Prince of Peace. 
life-changing power. You know, I was, uh, I was thinking about how to uh, make you aware and prepare you for these messages. And I remembered again one of my favorite authors. His name is Dallas Willard. Now, Dallas Willard is not light reading. I need to tell you that. He is a Baptist minister who teaches philosophy or taught philosophy for many years at the University of Southern California. I've had conversations with Dallas Willard. He's spoken in Texas numerous times. But let me read to you the disciplines that he catalogs in his book, The Spirit of the Disciplines. I've had this copy for many years. It is perhaps the most thorough book on spiritual formation that I've ever run across. He says there are two categories of disciplines that Jesus practiced. We're not talking about something that Jesus said you need to do. We're talking about things that Jesus clearly did. And how can you say you're following Jesus if you have no interest in doing what Jesus did? As I I shared a little while ago, it would be like the person saying, I'd like to hit a grand slam, so on my very first day at a baseball park, I hope I get to bat so I can hit a grand slam. Well, good luck with that. If we don't do the things that Jesus did, then how can we say we're following Him, and how can we suggest that we can live the Christian life that He wanted us to have? So listen to these disciplines. The disciplines of abstinence, that'll be the first group, and the disciplines of engagement. Now, those of you who are going to try to feverishly write these down, don't do that. Let me tell you, I'm going to put them on my blog. I've done it before, but I'm going to do it again. I'm going to put them on my blog at peoplesharingjesus.com, and you can get them there. The disciplines of abstinence, here they are. Solitude. We used to say, if you don't go apart, you'll come apart. Just finding some quiet. And using that quiet in ways that benefit you spiritually. Silence. Just hush sometimes. Boy, I need to hear that one. (laughs) Just hush. God gave us two ears and just one mouth. We're supposed to listen twice as much as we talk. Silence. Fasting. (laughs) By the way, not just food. You ought to fast from television. You ought to fast from entertainment. Fasting. Frugality. We're about to do a Dave Ramsey again, and uh, it's starting, in fact, today, I think. And Dave Ramsey, his famous saying is, I want to train you how to live like no one else so that you can live like no one else. Well, guess what? There are a lot of people who say, I wish that, you know, I wish I just didn't get so far behind on my bills. You know, wishing is never going to change anything. You have to change the way you function. And frugality, a frugal lifestyle, is a discipline of the spiritual life. It is. Chastity, secrecy. You might say, what do you mean secrecy, Pastor? Don't have to be patted on the back for everything you do. Do some stuff intentionally, hoping nobody will ever know you did them. Jesus told us to do that. And he never told us to do anything that he didn't do himself. Secrecy is a discipline of abstinence and sacrifice. There are so many people today who are committed to comfort. But a follower of Jesus is committed to sacrificial living. And then there are the disciplines of engagement. What are they? Study. Worship. Celebration. What's that? Celebration. It is that time when you just simply... Get excited about and celebrate with people in important milestones in their life. We had one this morning. Baptism is a celebration. It's a celebration of a choice, a decision. It is making a memory for the person baptized. Make those memories as you celebrate. Service. Jesus' classic example was washing dirty disciples' feet. Or the dirty feet of disciples, however you want me to say that. 
prayer. Some people say, well, pastor, all I can really do is pray for you. I'm just not physically. Well, listen, that's not an all you can do. Prayer is a discipline of engagement. Prayer, you couldn't possibly be more involved in something than to pray about it. It is a discipline of engagement. Fellowship. Intentionally spending time with brothers and sisters in Christ for the purpose of growing yourself and perhaps being used of God to produce growth in other people's lives. It's not eating cookies and drinking punch together. Although we might do that, that's not the kind of fellowship I'm talking about. Confession. You say, no, wait a minute. It, it's just being able to say, I messed up, forgive me. Confession. Not just to God, but to others. What a healing transforming reality that can be. And submission. And the word submission has gotten such a bad rap. Submission simply means to recognize God-given authority. Just to recognize it. And Jesus, the Son of the living God, clearly, as the Bible says, the Creator of the universe, submitted to the Father. He did. And he set that example for us, that submission to authority. You see, I'm a child really of the 50s and 60s, and in the 60s, the end thing was to challenge authority and to rebel against authority. And boy, have they paid. How high that price has been. But submission to authority to divine authority primarily, but certainly just to the concept of authority is a key to the life you really want if you had sense enough to want it. There's power in being a partner with the Prince of Peace. Paul said we are partners together with God. Now, remember, do not say, well, the pastor was talking about the stuff we need to do to go to heaven. Absolutely not. That's not at all. You totally missed. you got to stay for the 11 o'clock service if that's what you got. <laughs> Absolutely not. I am sharing with you in this message keys, the beginning of some keys about becoming the person that God intended you to be when He saved you. Not just sort of laying back in your easy chair and just trusting God to do everything that He needs to do to remake you, but doing what the Word says, doing what Jesus said, doing what Jesus did so that you can train yourself unto godliness. It'll pay dividends now and forever. Let's stand.